everyone. This is Robin and I am just thrilled to have this opportunity to chat with somebody who I hold in such high esteem. What, who we have here is Dale Swift, who just happens to be a neighborhood officer with the Toronto Police Department. And I am so excited to have this opportunity to chat with Dale about all things resiliency, specifically when we are thinking about just the current landscape of what's happening in our communities, what's happening. And I'm just so curious about how we can create partnership and collaborations to support youth and uh, children who sometimes might be at higher risk groups. So I'm very excited to chat with my dear colleague who we had a chance to meet a few years back at a conference about supporting oh, yeah. youth. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So uh, welcome. I'm super excited that we can chat about resiliency today. Thank you for joining me. Honestly, thank you. I'm super excited. My partner was actually making fun of me because I was so excited to talk to you. So <laughs> so Dale, tell me about what a neighborhood officer does in Toronto. Tell me, can you tell me a wee bit about what you do? So a neighborhood officer is, is pretty much an officer who is like entrenched in a community, not for investigation or what have you, but to really bridge that gap, uh, uh, sorry, bridge that gap um, on a consistent basis with the community that they serve. Um, for various reasons, that communication and that partnership has been, um, has been lacking, uh, which has caused further separation from us knowing uh, us knowing our, our communities and our communities knowing us. Mm -hmm. So the communities started speaking up saying, look, we want, if, if you want us to have a good partnership with you, give us officers that are willing to be in our neighborhoods um, despite certain situations or issue or even first, even res uh, resistance at first. Mm -hmm. We want those officers in there to try to build those relationships with us so then we can build those community partnerships. Uh, so that is what I'm supposed to do. And literally from there, uh, you speak to people, you get to, as a neighborhood officer, you're a guest. Yes. And I think we have to realize as police officers, when we go in the neighborhoods for an investigation or not, you're a guest there and you probably don't know the dynamics of the neighborhood or who is who and whatever. So we really have to take the time to, to realize that and, and, and act in a certain manner because we go there, we leave. So the impact that we have on individuals in that neighborhood stick with them but we have a tendency just to go call to call to call yes. so having that consistent officer um talking to the community and my phone is always going off um you have youth reaching out to you uh with concerns um that they have in regards to themselves in regards to their family cultural differences uh gang affiliations how they get out mental health has been absolutely hard i mean uh, absolutely huge yeah. because it's 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 affecting so many of our youth on, on such a large on, on a, a large scale mm -hmm. so sorry to wrap it all up i'm pretty much any and everything in that community yeah. so whatever they need i make sure i can help them and then they help me out as well so yeah. tps wins because we get investigations and i mean major investigations from homicides to to bike thefts we get everything solved but yet and we also have the trust of the community they see when i'm making arrests so like well someone made swift a, a, an officer today so we have to arrest them and they understand that because they understand 99 percent of the time i'm in there it's not for an arrest or for an investigation so when it happens they're like well it's inevitable how me um when you talk about creating community when you talk about creating a different type of a relationship with persons who may or may not have had positive relationship with law enforcement before that so very much ties in with my work on resiliency about this idea that we need to foster and cultivate safe spaces and communities so then that way that children grow up with that psychological safety that they know there are people who do believe in them that are are creating this allyship it's so important for youth to have that that modeling uh, especially when we think about children who are growing up maybe without some of those positive influences about how important it is to almost rewrite some of those narratives yes 100 percent yeah uh, now tell me tell me how that um if you're comfortable tell me what that's like when you're helping kind of break down some of those barriers some of those stereotypes some of those kind of misconceptions uh what what's that like uh well, first of all i'm a i'm an open book uh i really i i really try to preach to a lot of our youth and everybody strengthen strengthen vulnerability yeah and, and i try to explain to 
to, especially a lot of our, our young males, that to be a man and say I'm good and, and you don't have to cry or everything's okay when you know there's an internal struggle. I mean, like, that's not strength. That's not being a man. I said, a stronger person is someone who is actually able to admit um, and to share their vulnerability and saying to themselves, you know what, I feel uncomfortable. I'm going through this or that. Um, and sharing that with individuals with the possibility of being uh, judged um, mm -hmm. by doing so. I'm like, that is strength. Yeah. It is easy to withhold information about yourself or withhold feelings and say you're fine. And then as we know, destructive things happen. So I really talk about if you want to be strong, embrace your vulnerabilities, learn from them, take that extra stress off your shoulders and just live, mm -hmm. right? We are a sum of all of our experiences, but what we do with that is, is up to us, mm -hmm. right? We are not just, we're not um, a, an example of, of maybe bad upbringing or a particular bad neighborhood or what have you. So what I do is when I'm meeting with youth, when I get a chance to talk to them, I talk about my own struggle. I talk about living in Toronto housing, um, having a lot of violence around, having uh, an abusive mom, and I'll discuss how that looked, and I'll talk about the cultural stuff about West Indian, um, West Indian parenting, yes. and, and what's acceptable and what is not. And we talk about distorted loyalty, where uh, a lot of you feel that their parents can do anything to them, um, and they can't say anything because they're parents. Yeah. So we've coined that as distorted loyalty, mm -hmm. and we so we talk about that, and it's but it's me that has to make the first step. I can't go into a situation and, and expect them to start talking to a police officer because I don't know what their lived experiences are um, it, where I'm involved and not me particularly, but what I, what I, what I do. Mm -hmm. So to, to bridge that gap, I allow myself to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and allow them to see that I am really not that different from them mm -hmm. and that they do have choices. And then sometimes you are going to slip and fall on your face, mm -hmm. but you need to, especially nowadays, you need to have those resources to pick you back up. Yeah. And why not have a resource that really understands what you're going through? Mm -hmm. So you don't always have to feel like you have to explain everything. Because I, I accept you. I appreciate you. Now, where are we going from? Wow. So that's how I do it. I do it through vulnerability. Yeah, which is extraordinary, right? You're setting the example. You are modeling, again, what this could be, showing them potential. Like that is, that is absolutely extraordinary to see that resource available in our communities. Now, what I'm really curious about, and again, what you, you said so very well, is just understanding that, you know, there are going to be things that don't always add up. There's going to be, there are going to be hard times. And again, resiliency isn't something you use once, you know, it's something that <laughs> no. always comes back. And I know when I'm working with my own children, as well as other children and teenagers, we often talk about this idea that you never want to waste a mistake right? You never want to waste a mistake because that's where that learning can happen. That's where we really can kind of um, understand what's kind of underneath in terms of what we need to be thinking about, what we need to be working upon. So one of my kind of my question I would have for you then is when we are working with youth who do have a lot of, um, there's a lot of pressures. There's so much pressure about maintaining appearances, maintaining status, what is your suggestion or recommendation when we are working with youth that feel that real pull from their social circles and kind of like even just their old stories about who they should be and what they should be about? How do you suggest working with youth to help them kind of see alternative paths like you are describing in your work? Um, well, once again, I think it's making yourself vulnerable and you starting yeah. the conversation, giving stories or anecdotes about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of find out that, yeah, you're right. Like a lot of the youth do have a lot of stressors. Some of them are parents to their younger kids and some of them are parents to their adults. Yes. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of pressure, not only within the, the home, but within the community. And now with social media, yeah. like a lot of these youth have a lot to deal with, right? Yeah. And everything is rush, 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 rush. So if they feel that if they're not at a certain level or at a certain stage in their life, they're a failure. Mm -hmm. uh so i it, it's when you're working with youth you just have to you have to understand that there's going to be some resistance first okay because as uh, an authoritative figure or as an authoritative figure they 
you naturally will be resistant to that until you disseminate any of the ideologies that they have about you already. Yeah. So if they see you as a counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever, that's great. And they have their own perception, show them something different that's completely out of that, uh, mm -hmm. out of that realm. Um, Cause I find when you do that, like I'll come here, the first thing people see is my uniform. Mm -hmm. But when I start talking, they forget about the uniform. And they're not looking here. You're looking here yeah and then you can have those conversations but you have to you have to you literally just have to show them something different than what you represent yeah, yeah um, if you want to because their wall is going to be up to this and the yeah. wall is going to be up to that yeah so you can kind of open the door to something else and go hi i'm here i know this is here but just yeah trust me come on this side so yeah. that's realistically what you and it's patience you have to be patient it's not going to happen on the first time. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen the second time. Or maybe it will. It all depends on how you connect with them. But the thing is, youth want to connect. Yes. They, they want to connect. But they are so used to being put down. Mm -hmm. or, 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 um, or what's it called? Judged or labeled yes. by either society, social media, their communities, and their own families. That they're so used to disappointment sometimes, which is unfortunate. So here we are as someone else trying to tell them how to be, right? But they don't want to hear it from us because A, they think that we're only going to be here temporarily, right? Yeah. In some cases, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And that they are so used to, to disappointment and people telling them what to do. And, and yes. so they're going to be resistant. Mm -hmm. um, and not because they want to, but just how they are kind of engineered to. Yeah. Because they have a particular um, algorithm. Yes. They are so certain things happen. So we have to change their algorithm mm -hmm. because they already have A plus B plus C in yeah. multiple scenarios. So mm -hmm. A plus B with us has to equal like X 12, 22,000. Yeah. Yeah. Totally throw them off. Yeah. So we have to change their algorithm in regards to what they're used to. That's a brilliant reflection. That is absolutely Brilliant. Now, another question I have for you, given that you care deeply about your communities that you serve, you wouldn't be in neighborhood policing if you didn't care about your communities. How, how do you set up boundaries for yourself when you care so deeply about the people that you are working with? Um, but at the end of the day, you're also a person and you have your own responsibilities, your own families. And one of the things um, we have been seeing in my work, especially in the spirit of COVID with what's going on, we're seeing like high scores of compassion fatigue in groups of persons that we don't usually see it in, but people are yeah. feeling really worried. They're feeling really overwhelmed because people are hurting. People are having a hard time. So I'm so curious, whenever I get to talk to persons on the front lines, what are some of your strategies, if you're comfortable sharing us with how, how do you separate the two? How do you manage caring so deeply, <laughs> but then also showing up for yourself and your family? I, I think I've had a lot of practice before policing um, uh, in regards to working in social services, working with youth, working with mental health, and, and then everything was trial and error, right? You literally had your, your communication. You always wanted to be there for the kids. Sometimes you got burned, you know, and, and, and then sometimes you did too, too, too much and got too involved. And it's hard to, when you're, when you're in a situation when you're, when you're involved, it's very hard to kind of figure out where that, that line is really until it's almost crossed crossed and you're like, yeah. okay, this is, this is an issue. Yeah. Uh, so <sighs> that's a really good, I was going to say to you, but with me, I, I know I, I definitely struggled with it and still struggle with it, treating that line uh, because there are certain situations in certain youth that if you tell a youth to, to reach out to you and you don't, uh, I mean, if they reach out, they reach out to you and you don't pick up or just yeah. come back you may have lost that, that possible chance of, of being there for them, mm -hmm. right? So I always articulate that. I'm like, if you guys need me, I will get to you as soon as I can. But if I can, it's not because I don't want to. Yeah. It's just because I just haven't seen the message or I'm spending time with family. So my, my balance comes from recognizing that I have to have energy for my family as well. 
Right. And uh, that whole recharge thing, because when I go home, my son's like, daddy, 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 daddy. daddy. Yeah. And if I'm giving, and, and like you cone, and I love this, it is knowing your non-negotiables. Yeah. And, and when you said that, I was like, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was like, what are mine? Mm-hmm. So as much as I want to give all this energy to the community, which I will, I always have to make sure I have that much more for my family and especially my, my, my son who is in that stage of finding himself and whatever. So I can't have less energy for him. Mm-hmm. So on, on my days off, I rest. I literally watch cartoons. Because <laughs> I want nothing, with, with, nothing with reality. So I don't watch yeah. the news. And with my work phone, I check it in the morning and then I check it at night. Whereas before I was checking it all the time because my concern was I was so scared to miss an important call. Yeah. Um, and I felt like I was doing it by myself and the burnout started to happen. Yeah. Uh, so the guidelines is just, you just be, be real. Just say you will be there, but sometimes you may not be able to. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's, it's just really being straight up in regards to how the relationship is going to work. Mm-hmm. and be like I'm there for you but like once again I do have my life and they'll appreciate that I have my life outside of this yeah. and and people typically respect the boundaries mm-hmm. unless there's a lot of stuff going on in their life and the first thing they do is they think of is to, is to call you yeah which is great when you're a police officer where someone is actually in a situation that probably involves police and the first person who calls a police officer yeah. you know you've done something good Absolutely. So that, yeah so balance is great I put down my phone I let whoever I'm dealing with know when I'm available, when I'm not available. And if I'm not, why is that? Yeah. And really just try to take it in from there. And I also tell my wife and my son to like, look, if I look burned out and I think I'm okay, have that conversation. Mm-hmm. So it's putting our pride aside because she'd be like, uh, you're off today. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And that reaction right there really shows that I'm completely yes. up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's me stepping out of myself to go, you know what? If they're seeing it, I might not see it. I need to listen. Mm-hmm. So it's putting pride aside as well and listening to the people that you trust who know you that know when you're burning up. So I'm mindful of your time, Dale. And I know um, you have just so much wisdom and so much expertise that I'm just so honored that you're sharing with us all today. So thank you for that. The last kind of question I'm so curious about from your lived experience, working with youth, from your own kind of reflections, what, what do you think really helps or contributes to, to someone being resilient? Where, where do you see that? Where do you see that resiliency grow from? Huh. Well, from, and the funny thing, my resilience didn't come from my family, ironically enough. Mm-hmm. It was, my family was a trigger for me. Yeah. So my resilience came from various community partners. Like there were teachers uh, who understood that I was really undiagnosed ADD and I needed to sometimes just get up and just walk and then come back and I could focus. Yes. Uh, that was fantastic. Then there was also coaches yes. who really inspired me to, to, to be something different despite my situation that kind of told me something different. Mm-hmm. And it was, oh my gosh, you name it. There's all these individuals because when it says it takes a community to raise a child, yes. it is true. Mm-hmm. And it just legitimately just takes that person just to care Mm -hmm. and and youth know when you're genuine yes so if i come to them like hey i'm officer swift and uh i want to get to know you today they'd be like who's this guy right (laughs) they'd be like and they'll they'll dip they'll be like i'm out i'm like thank you officer whoever you are but uh i'm not interested so it's um once again it's making yourself vulnerable to them Mm -hmm. and uh just just showing showing something different Mm -hmm. and once they kind of see that they open up Mm -hmm. because a lot of these youth think that they're alone yeah if you think about it like in gangs and so on and so forth gangs don't call themselves gangs they call themselves family yes and and a lot of these youth can be recruited Mm -hmm. is because they have acceptance yes and because they have someone looking out for them quote unquote it may not be true but that's what they feel Mm -hmm. so why can't we do that yeah Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Dale, like, I'm just like, my head is just ricocheting right now with so many things to share with you and talk to you back with. That's why I love talking with you about this, because first of all, like you're absolutely right. One, 
caring, consistent adult in a child's life can be transformational, like transformational. And it could be even just one interaction. That's what so many people think that it has to be like, you know, big or like a lifeline commitment to a child. But what the research says is one just mind blowing interaction with the child where they seem, they feel validated and seen. And you have that responsible adult showing them a different way that they could become is a game changer. I also am thinking about time when I was working as um, I was doing my training at Kingston Penitentiary. And I remember working uh, with a few persons, uh, incarcerated persons. And I remember this one um, uh, inmate that I was working with, and he just described what you described in terms of the, the family, the, the fact that he was waiting to be recruited because he was so desperate to belong to anything. And he said to me, if there was another option, I would have taken it, but there mm-hmm. wasn't any other option. He said, there was nowhere to walk around to Robin. Like this was, this was the best that I could have ever hoped for. Now here I am working with him, you know, he's incarcerated now longer than he ever was out on the street, right? Like he lived yeah. longer, he lives longer in maximum security than he ever was as a youth out in the, in the real world. But he said like, that was, that was the closest thing to family he ever, ever felt. And, you know, that's where I feel as though so often we think we're so helpless to this really complex system that we can't help our youth. Like they're already on this trajectory that's going to land them in precarious situations. But I'm so appreciative that you echo today the fact that these interactions do make a difference. And if when children and youth, especially at risk youth are given an alternative, they will gladly take the alternative versus getting involved in risk-taking behavior. Yeah, the youth want someone to be proud of them and accept them. They do, how big their shell is or how big their wall is. They just want someone to say, you know what, I appreciate you and and show interest. Show, show, it doesn't have to be an interest I think they have. Whenever they're into, just show some interest. That's it. And uh, it'll go a long, long way. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, um, in in the book, uh, Calm Within the Storm, that I've been able to put forward, one of the big pieces, the heart of resiliency ties into that notion of community. And that community is what we create. We don't have to be born into it. It's not based on our, our professions, our race, our gender, our ethnicity. Like there are so many different ways that we can forge community with persons uh, who share similar values and beliefs that really bring out the best in persons. Um, So I'm just so appreciative for you and the services that you provide our communities, how different so many people's world would be if there were more, if there were more Dales in their lives. So Dale, thank you. Thank you um, for what you do. And again, I just think community has to be created. It's not, it, it won't happen by default positive, healthy community relationships happen with intention. And I just want to thank you for your service because you are making a positive impact in the lives of adolescents in Toronto. So thank you very much. Thank you. Honestly, thank you so much. Um, And thank you for the opportunity. This was a great talk. Hopefully you can have another one. Um, And I am so looking forward to your book. I'm not even a reader. My wife's like, you need to read. I'm like, wait, I'm getting a book. Leave me alone. So... (laughs) Well, if it's any consolation, it's also on an audio book because my kids were waiting for the audio version because they're like, really, really? Um, And uh, yeah, so we will make sure that there is a copy heading your way. And again, thank you so much for your time.